I'm the uh, Chief Executive of the Mental Health Foundation. Um, I'm also a, a father, uh, I'm a sometimes surfer, I'm a gardener, uh, I'm a person living with bipolar disorder. Um, I've been bereaved by suicide in my family um, and I've also survived my own um, suicide attempt. Uh, um, but please see me as a total person um, with all of those exper experiences being brought to bear. So um, I'm from the Mental Health Foundation. We've, we've, uh, we're a non-government organisation. We're set up by a telethon um, way back in the 1970s. We've been here for 40 years this year. I just want to uh, talk on my, uh, my colleagues, Kieran Fox over there, who works with Canterbury District Health Board on the All Right campaign, the All Right um, Positive Mental Health um, uh, uh, campaign in the Christchurch area and Virginia Brooks uh, at the back who works uh, on our uh, bereavement support postvention project. Um, uh, we are essentially a, a public health, uh, mental health organisation focused on trying to provide leadership and uh, uh, trying to stimulate public health responses to mental health and well-being. One of the areas which we engage in uh, is the area of suicide prevention. Um, you've heard a couple of the things that we do in terms of uh, bereavement support. Um, we also produce a range of resources uh, uh, aimed at, at a variety of perspectives of the issue. Um, uh, we've, and we've got a table of these resources uh, out there, so please help yourselves. So, uh, we're big promoters of positive mental health and the five ways to well-being is one of the frameworks we use. As you heard me mention from the, the floor before, we also engage with the media around uh, um, issues of suicide prevention reporting. We've just produced a resource for um, those uh, who've been affected by suicide called Comment No Comment, which uh, is guidelines for, for them in terms of their choices about engaging with the media. Um, really encourage you to uh, take this one away, uh, which is um, having suicidal thoughts and finding a way back, um, which uh, has my own personal uh, um, uh, well-being plan in it. So this is a, a self-care um, support document that um, we really want people to, clinicians to use, community organisations to use. Tihe Māori Ora, which is taking uh, a tikanga Māori perspective on suicide prevention. And then, are you worried about someone who may be thinking about suicide? Again, a support for people um, to support others. Um, so that's my little ad, but I will also say we've all had a big win. I just got a phone call uh, to say that the New Zealand police are announcing this afternoon that they are reversing their policy of discriminating against people who are on medication for their, uh, in their recruitment. So they will be now um, ending that policy. So it's a big win for um, uh, reducing stigma and discrimination in New Zealand. <laughs> Yep. That is brilliant. And the little book inside that staff who have used it with clients have found it fantastic. Oh, thank you for that feedback. Um, in everything we do, we, we take a co design approach, working with people with lived experience. Um, so um, many people need to take credit for that, but thank you for that feedback. And do take some. They're flying off our shelves like hotcakes. I had to virtually sneak those out of the office, so, um, so grab them while they're there. Um, I've been given the really easy task of talking about shared leadership in uh, suicide prevention. You know, it's a simple thing to do and I've been given about 15 minutes, so no worries. Um, so I guess the first question is, shared leadership with whom? Uh, well, I think it's basically everybody. Um, you know, it's clinicians, yes, uh, and we're very, very happy to support the Zero Suicide uh, in, uh, in Clinical Services initiative. You know, that's a critical part of suicide prevention. But it's also NGOs in the community. It's people with lived experience uh, of attempting uh, to take their own lives. Uh, it's families who've been bereaved or affected by, um, by suicide. It's the media themselves. Um, it's 
the whole of government, not just the Ministry of Health, not just the DHBs, it is all of government and government's interactions uh, with the community. It's concerned individuals, concerned people in the community. Um, uh, people like Sean Lyons, who's been prepared to put his own money on the table, coming from a business background, because he's concerned about this issue. Um, it's impacted communities uh, where, um, where, the, where uh, suicide is not just an individual uh, um, or, or, or nuclear family event, but impacts on communities. It is Māori, it is Pacific people, it is everybody. So how do you share leadership um, in that kind of context? Well, leadership of what? Um, and this is a kind of a, from the Mental Health uh, Foundation's perspective, this is our kind of work in progress towards a framework for suicide prevention. Um, so, uh, you know, good crisis support services that are easily acceptable, uh, that are culturally responsive, um, that are trauma informed, that are there when people need them in a way that they need them, absolutely vital. You know, and of course that is part of the zero suicide um, approach. Then, you know, really effective recovery services, you know, services that are geared towards people moving on and being able to fully recover. Um, you know, focused around engaging fauna and family, um, you know, have peer input, uh, peer-led, peer support, again, culturally responsive, um, and a range of options from um, uh, residential through to community-based. Um, you know, very, very important. But in fact, um, all of these factors that are, were listed here are interconnected. If I could, if I was cleverer with shapes, I would make every one of these, um, whatever the gongs they are, um, touch every other one, because every part of this interconnects with every other part of it. So, you know, we, we need to address um, the social determinants of mental and emotional distress um, that is leading uh, people to uh, consider taking their own lives. We need a more equal and accepting community. You know, it is total, and we all need to take responsibility for leadership in this. You know, it was really heartening and encouraging uh, that the New Zealand Society of Psychologists, I think it was, worked with the Child Poverty Action Group to produce a report about the impacts of child poverty uh, on, on mental health and well-being uh, uh, earlier this year. You know, that is, the, that is shared leadership around suicide prevention. You know, we need to be promoting resilience and well-being. Uh, we need to be getting well ahead of uh, responding to uh, mental and emotional distress, responding to suicidality, as my, my friend talked about at lunchtime with me today, to actually, um, uh, to actually preventing, to, to building resilience in the community, uh, to building positive mental health. You know, to take, we shouldn't need an earthquake, uh, as happened here in Canterbury, for an all right type program, which is a population-wide um, behaviour change, resilience building, positive mental health approach to mental health and well-being. We need to build that floor um, of positive mental health into the community. We need to address the research which talks about safety, about key safety issues like reducing access to means, um, <laughs> like the fact that we know that one of the reasons we have high levels of suicides in rural communities is access to guns. You know, if we took away the guns, less people would die. Or if we had, you know, means of reducing access to those guns, less people would die. Um, we know from the research that if the media uh, does not uh, talk about means, then less people die. So, you know, we need to address um, those safety measures. Um, and we need to find the ways to create safe talk about suicide prevention. And a lot of the debate this morning, or a lot of the discussion this morning was, how do we do this? You know, this is an issue that generates a lot of energy, a lot of emotion, very deep emotion in individuals and in the community. Um, we've actually had the perfect storm, I believe, in the last two years for a frenzy of media um, uh, uh, focus 
on suicide, let's talk about suicide, uh, in the last couple of years. Um, uh, but there's, we need to get past this assumption that just talking about suicide uh, is actually a useful thing. Um, just talking about suicide may actually lead to more people dying, and there was a lot of research um, to support that. Talking about suicide prevention is quite a different thing, um, and we need to be very, very clear that we are talking about suicide prevention, not simply advertising and normalising suicide. Um, I can speak, I guess, you know, just from my own experience. I don't claim from my lived experience to be an absolute expert. But um, uh, if I had, if, if I had been seeing the images of 606 shoes of people who killed themselves uh, in the last year, day after day in the news media, at a certain time in my life when I was feeling extremely vulnerable, and when, um, when the messages in my brain were, just do it, just kill yourself, just end it, just stop, you know, just do it, just kill yourself. Um, not once, but hundreds of times a day, that message was going through my brain. Now, it's a really hard message to actually respond to, because as humans, we're hardwired to survive. You know, actually stepping over that threshold to take your own life takes courage, takes organisation, or it takes opportunity. Um, but it takes courage. Uh, my brother took his own life, and, and in the note that he left, he said, I'm sorry I did this just before Christmas. I chickened out several times when I was trying to do it further away from Christmas. It takes courage, and courage is contagious. So if I saw those 606 shoes at that time when I was really, really vulnerable, that would have said, yeah, other people are doing it. You can do it. You can listen to that voice. You can go that step further. It's actually what so many people are doing it, Sean. Just do it. Do it, do it, do it. If I saw those 606 shoes and I saw a whole lot of stories about, I feel like this, but I got through it and I survived, you know, um, and this is what, what happened to get me through it. These are, the, these are the things that got me through it and this is where, you know, I got help and you could get help. That's spreading the courage to survive. That's spreading the courage to hang on that little bit longer and find that support that keeps you alive. So, um, you know, safe talk is very important, and that's about equipping the community, and that's why I very much support um, Life Keepers um, uh, and, and other initiatives like that, equipping the community to be that first line of support, but equipping them to understand how to be supportive. Um, so many people are activated and energised when they encounter uh, suicide. Uh, in some way, shape or form, whether it's in their family, their friendship network, their community, and they want to do something, but many people don't know what to do. Uh, or their first instinct is to do something which may actually not be that useful. So let's equip them, let's, let's harness that energy together to equip them to do things which are actually useful and effective. And part of that is eliminating stigma. And then let's also empower self-care. Uh, because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the reason why I've now gone on to thrive is because, yes, I got clinical, good clinical support. Um, it was primarily because I got really good um, empathetic support from some close friends, and that's what helped to lead me to then be able to get the clinical care. But then it's also because, it, oh, by trial and error, um, and, and some support from other people, I learned things like the five ways to well-being and other ways to manage my life better so that I now go on to thrive even though I'm still living with bipolar disorder. So we need to also empower self-care. And it's all of those things working together um, that will lead to reduced deaths, reduced self-harm um, and increased well-being. And I think there's a huge amount of synergy between the, the concepts there and the concepts of zero suicide within a, a healthcare system. And I love the way um, you were talking, um, Joe, about, uh, about the implications sort of um, spreading out from healthcare systems into young people and into the wider community. And I think it, can, it, it should work both ways. So 
leadership of that, we all need to take leadership of all of that. Oop, what done there? Um, and the thing we need to avoid, and, and you know, this is you know very consistent with the just culture um, uh, philosophy uh, that's been talked about a lot today, is getting into the blame game. And I think you know one of the real tragedies of the last uh, last year uh, in in the collective attempt to acknowledge the issue of uh, suicide prevention or the need for suicide prevention in our community and, and the lack of leadership is that it leaves things very open to a cycle of blame. And a cycle of blame, in my mind, goes this way. Blame, ass covering, um, you know, and you know, we already heard about Merseyside, and I, I know this happens in, other, in DHBs here in New Zealand, immediately straight to avoiding litigation, lockdown of information, um, you know, uh, let's not have a relational approach to this, let's have a litigation avoidance uh, risk management approach to the staffer, you know, trolling through the, the the notes that they that they wrote to make sure that there's nothing that they could be held accountable for, or you know, that they could be tripped up on. You know, it's an ass covering, uh, info lockdown um, environment, which leads to no learning whatsoever, um, which leads to no progress. So we're not leading ourselves anywhere. If we take that approach as a as a community, not just as a as a health system, but as a community. Um, by contrast, if we take a shared accountability approach with a shared leadership approach, so when a death occurs by suicide, you know that is a tragedy. That is a tragedy, and it creates grief. It creates questions. It creates guilt. It creates all of those things. Um, and it's a different type of experience from other types of, of death because of the stigma around mental health, because of the illness, because of the, st the specific stigmas around um, suicide. Um, and so it's very easy for people to start blaming. But in actual practice, we are all, we all need to share accountability when that death occurs. You know, when my brother took his own life, there are things that my family could have done differently. There are things that I could have done differently, you know, in the lead up to, to that. Um, so the bereaved need to take accountability for, what, uh, for, for um, suicides. Families, communities, schools, all of government, all clinicians, the media needs to take accountability uh, for suicide. Now, that, that has to be in that compassionate but accountable learning frame. So if we frame our leadership of suicide prevention in terms of mutual accountability, we're all in this together to solve this, then we start to front up to what went wrong, but in a compassionate learning frame, we learn from the mistakes and less people die. I mean, that's the, that's the best way I can put it. You know, that's what we're, you know, that's what we're aiming for. So shared leadership needs to mean shared accountability and a no blame game environment. So how are we going to get this? Well, you know, we've just had a, a change of government. Uh, we, we had a draft suicide prevention strategy that came out earlier this year to quite a lot of controversy. It's back on the drawing board. Um, and we don't know what's going to come out. Um, we've got a new Minister of Health, a uh, new government. If I was them, I would want to be really sure of what that next version of the suicide prevention strategy is going to look like before I put it out there, given the way the last one was received. But, you know, is it going to take that kind of holistic um, approach? Um, is it going to create an action plan with clear roles for everybody? Is it going to engender that shared leadership, shared responsibility environment? Is it going to have targets and resources? Well, we don't know. So, um, you know, that is a, there's a, a big opportunity, I think, at the moment to create some shared leadership. Um, but there are, there are other ways that I think, whether, well, I just want to float an idea that a number of us in the sector have been talking about. I think there are two things that could make a big contribution to shared leadership. 
One is a sort of mind frame type service um, uh, within New Zealand. So we heard about in Australia there's a much better, a much more resourced organisation that engages with the mainstream media around its reporting um, on suicide prevention. Um, and so we must not give up the ground of trying to influence the narrative that the mainstream media is creating. But I think there's an opportunity to create, and I can only come up with the, the like minds like mine analogy, create a kind of a platform and identity for suicide prevention. So like minds like mine, uh, as I'm sure you all know, it's now a 20-year-old social marketing um, uh, program uh, which has been about uh, reducing stigma and discrimination in New Zealand. It's got at times a you know, high, uh, high visibility mainstream media advertising level, it's got a major online and social media level and it's got a community um, uh, activity kind of level and it's a long term program. Well, imagine if we had something like that that could create a suicide prevention narrative that ran alongside and eventually started to overlap and influence the mainstream media narrative around suicide and suicide prevention. It could be a repository for recovery stories. How many recovery stories have we seen um, reported you know, in the last two years? Well, a few, because you know, various of us have pushed really hard for them. Um, but you know, stories of hope, um, survivor stories, um, a repository for resources and research, guidance, and sort of creating a kind of uh, a social movement for people, building on something like um, uh, life keepers, um, uh, you know, guidance for people about how to help, um, beh a behaviour based movement that gave people practical tools about how they could engage and how they could use their energy um, to support suicide prevention. Um, stories of communities, you know, a hub for where to get help, um, essentially action for hope and change and building that narrative uh, of suicide prevention. So uh, I'll leave, leave you with that idea to buzz about amongst yourselves, um, but I think uh, ultimately shared leadership is about a shared philosophy, a shared understanding of suicide and suicide prevention. Um, it, it parallels very much the principles of zero suicide within healthcare, but it needs to be taken out to in, incorporate, incorporate um, the full public health perspective on mental health and well-being. So thank you very much.